Hello everyone and a very, very warm welcome to this event run by the LSE Law School and uh, in association with the Mannheim Centre for Criminology here at LSE, one of our online events uh, with our subject, an intriguing and important subject, how to get away with killing a social science counter investigation. Uh, you can hash, use the hashtag on the opening slide at LSE Law if you would like to tweet about the event as it's going on. We very, very much hope to produce a podcast from the event so that you will be able to uh, revisit it or other people unable to join us uh, this evening will be able to take advantage of this fantastic panel uh, we have this evening. Uh, a, a very, my name is Nicola Lacey. I am in the law school at LSE. I'm school professor of law, gender and social policy. And it gives me very, very particular pleasure to uh, welcome tonight uh, three very distinguished panelists and I'm going to introduce them in order first and uh, principally Professor Didier Fassin whose book um, Death of a Traveller is, is the main topic that we are going to be talking about this evening. Um, Professor Fassin uh, is really one of the most influential, if not the most influential, interdisciplinary social scientists writing in the world today. He is James D. Wolfenson Professor of Social Science at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, and he holds a direction of studies in political and moral anthropology uh, at the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris. He's also been appointed the Chair of Public Health at the Collège de France. Didier was the founding director of the Interdisciplinary Research Institute for Social Sciences, which brings together anthropologists, sociologists, historians, political scientists, and legal scholars around contemporary political and social issues. He's widely known for his work on humanitarianism in local and international policies, especially towards the poor, the immigrants and the refugees, as well as victims of violence and epidemics. Over the last decade, he's been undertaking ethnographic research on policing the justice system and prisons in France, producing a number of really extraordinary books. His work brings into dialogue both the broad structural and historical forces which shape state power and an acute apprehension of the micro dynamics of that power in practices such as policing and imprisonment. This evening, he will be discussing themes from his recent book, his most recent book, Death of a Traveller, uh, a work which engages in a counter investigation of a fatal encounter between armed French police and a member of the traveling community. This book raises deep and troubling questions about the quality of interactions between marginalized communities and official power and judicial processes, about power, prejudice, and the social construction of truth, about the responsibilities of the social scientist, and about the, the very possibility, in a way, of criminal justice. So we're, we're delighted to have you here, uh, Didier, and thank you so much for your time. I'm going to introduce everybody at the beginning in the order in which they're speaking. So next, a, a very warm welcome to Christina Varvia, who is currently research fellow and formerly the deputy director of Forensic Architecture, which is based at Goldsmiths uh, University of London. Forensic Architecture is a research agency investigating human rights violations including violence committed by states, police forces, militaries, and corporations. And I think I'm right in saying that the Mark Duggan case, which many uh, of our participants today will be familiar with, has been one of the objects of your counter investigations. Um, forensic architecture works in partnership with institutions across civil society, from grassroots activists to legal teams, international NGOs, media organizations, to carry out investigations with and on behalf of communities and individuals affected by conflict, by police brutality, border regimes, and environmental violence. Christina was trained as an architect and has taught at the Architectural Association. She's currently teaching at the Centre for Research Architecture at Goldsmiths, 
and pursuing her PhD at Aarhus University. And she's also a fellow at the Louisiana Museum of Modern Art and a founding member of the Chair of Board of Trustees of Forensis. Last but not least, my very treasured colleague, Richard Martin, uh, who is assistant professor here at LSE in the Law School. He was previously a fellow at the Department of Law here and a British Academy postdoc fellow at the Bonavero Institute of Human Rights in Oxford. He's been a consultant for the Law Commission, a visiting fellow at the University of New South Wales and managing editor of the Oxford Human Rights blog. His recent book, Policing Human Rights, draws on a year of fieldwork with the Police Service of Northern Ireland to produce an account of how human rights law is interpreted and applied, but also redefined and resisted by a variety of officers, officers conducting routine policing. Richard uses uh, concepts from socio-legal studies, from criminology and from anthropology to examine the role of human rights norms in everyday police practices and vernaculars. So it's a fantastic panel. Thank you all so much. And Didier, first of all, Didier will speak for perhaps uh, 20 to 30 minutes or a little bit longer. And then each of our commentators will speak for 10 minutes. So we hope to have plenty of time for your own questions uh, at the end. So over to you, Didier, and very many thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I should say that I'm very honored to be uh, giving this uh, public lecture uh, at LSE. And uh, of course, uh, uh, I also have much regret not to be there uh, in person. Uh, but I hope that uh, we will have uh, uh, other opportunities in the future to, to, to meet uh, personally. Um, so I want to, to, to thank uh, you, uh, Professor uh, uh, Nicolas Lassay for your uh, invitation and I should say that when I was writing my book on prison worlds uh, your uh, own work was um, uh, was very uh, important for me. Um, I am grateful also to uh, Molly Reed for uh, making the organization of this event uh, quite smooth. Um, it is great to have uh, uh, Christina Varvia uh, 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 as a representative of this uh, uh, this extraordinary organization, uh, forensic architecture, and it is clear that my counter investigation, in a much more modest way, uh, has something to do with the kind of work uh, that that you're uh, doing, and and finally to Richard Martin for uh, discussing, uh, perhaps from uh, his perspective of human rights, which of course uh, is, is a, are very much involved in this case. So I gave uh, the title of uh, how to get away uh, with uh, killing. I could have added when you belong to the police, although it is almost, uh, almost obvious. So as uh, Nicola has asked, asked me, uh, I will begin with a brief reminder of the facts. A presentation of my experimental way of treating them, and finally uh, a discussion about the implications of these uh, the, the choices I made <clears throat> uh, in in terms of uh, writing and inquiry. So it it all started with an email I received two years ago, uh, or a little more, uh, from a collective of three women called Truth and Justice for Angelo asking me to give a talk uh, at a meeting uh, they were having on police and prison to enlighten the case of a 37 year old traveler, that is a Roma man, who had been killed by a special unit of the gendarmerie, the uh, GIGN for Group of Intervention of the National Gendarmerie, officially dedicated to terrorist attacks and hostage situations. They had come to arrest him as he was deemed to have absconded because he had not returned to prison following home leave, his sentence having been given for repeated minor violations of the law. They said they had to shoot him in self-defense as he had surprised them in the dark shed of his parents' farm by savagely attacking them with a weapon. The event had taken place in the center of France, had not made the national news, 
and the three women were the victim's sister and two of her friends. I had never heard of the case, but after having been solicited by these women, I read the few articles that had been published in local media. The official version given by the officers seemed so implausible that I got interested. A frail man alone who assaults with what appeared to be a pocket knife, a group of five tall officers, super trained for dangerous operations, impressive in their dark uniforms with balaclavas, helmets, and bulletproof jackets, carrying semi-automatic pistols, some machine guns, and grenades, and who resists two taser shots, each of them of 50,000 volts, supposed to paralyze and sometimes even causing death, to the point that the officers have no op other option than to kill him. A quite unlikely sequence. However, I could not say anything about the case and I only sent to uh, the uh, three members uh, of, the, of this group a short text with general ideas drawn from my previous work on policing, punishment and prison, which was read at the event. In the following month, I stayed in contact with the three women, especially the sister, who demonstrated remarkable courage and tenacity in her claim for truth and justice through peaceful demonstrations. At the end of a year and a half judicial investigation, the examining judge decided to dismiss the case, accepting that the killing was justified by self-defense. Her decision was confirmed in appeal. The family was dismayed, to convince them to be heard by the investigators in the hours following Angelo's death, the prosecutor had promised them that he would do all he could to get to the truth. He added that this would be the judicial truth. The family and the whole traveler community considered they were cheated. During that period, I got to know well Angelo's sister, his parents, his brothers, and in-laws. I visited them several times in the farm where the killing had taken place. Several caravans were stationed in the, in the yard. It was where they cooked and slept. But our conversations were taking place in the common space in front of the main building. At some point, the idea of writing a book about this tragic story came to my mind. I shared it with the family and they immediately accepted, even though I explained to them that I would not only rely on their version, but would do my own inquiry, which would consider all testimonies. So I interviewed all the persons involved I could. The five members of the family who had witnessed the killing a few yards outside of the barn, lying on the floor under the control of the heavy weapons. The lawyers of the family and of the young man on a previous case. The public prosecutor and the two examining judges. Despite many requests at the local and national levels of the gendarmerie, I was not authorized to meet with the two officers who had shot, but I had for each of them and for their three colleagues present at the scene, multiple detailed sworn statements from their interrogations by the investigators. And finally, the journalist and the coroner never replied to my various emails and phone calls. I also gathered all the documents I could find. The five handwritten accounts by family members made just after the event. The 27 statements of witness depositions. The autopsy and ballistics reports, that of weapon examination and the toxicology and forensic analysis. The record of the reconstruction of the events and of the visit to the scene the public prosecution's charges and the defense lawyer's responses, the ruling that dismissed the case and its upholding on appeal, the 14 press releases from the support committee and the 28 articles in the regional press. With this material, I experimented a particular form of ethnography in two ways. First, in the mode of writing, second, in conduct, conducting a counter investigation. So in the first chapters of the book, I use a polyphonic form of writing. I recount in a third person, the event 
from the perspective of the two parents who witnessed the events from outside the shed, laying on the ground, and we say there were only a few seconds between the time the five officers entered the barn and the shots without warning. The two officers who killed the man and described how they loudly announced their presence, how they discovered the man, did everything to control him uh, and uh, while fighting with him in the dark and eventually had to shoot as he was threatening their lives despite Tazer electric shocks. The sister was away taking a lesson and later led the protest for truth and justice. The journalist who wrote the article reproducing the police's ver version, the coroner who told his colleague on the radio that officers had told him the man had no weapon and whose conversation was recorded without him knowing it, the prosecutor and the judges. By the perspective, I mean here what they said had occurred. Of course, the versions are incompatible, but they are treated in my writing equally as if each protagonist was telling the truth. So I will just give you a short example uh, of, these, uh, of, of this way of writing, and they are excerpts from the first and second chapter. First chapter is titled The Father. He's on the doorstep when he sees the gate, op the gate open and gendarmes dressed in dark uniforms, balaclavas and helmet and armed to the teeth storm into the courtyard. He has just the time to say to his son who is sitting in the little lounge, go hide, go hide, pointing to the, the shed. The space, a lean-to around 20 yards square, square yards uh, attached to the house is used as a lumber, a lumber room. It is where he stores the objects he collects to sell in secondhand markets, books of uh, cartoons, old furniture, bicycles, strollers. There's also an air conditioner and a generator. Angelo slips behind him, enters the dark room and shuts the door. The father sees him disappear in his sweatpants and colored t-shirt. The Zhejiang men swarm into the courtyard, a lot of them, 15 or so, maybe more. They yell orders. The father sees one of them rush towards him, shouting at him to kneel down with his hands above his head. He refuses to comply. He has never been willing to bow down to the police. The officer pushes him to the ground and makes him lie face down. He, he handcuffs him behind his back. He trains his submachine gun on his head. Don't move or we'll shoot you. With his tube in his nose, the father says he can't breathe. He's sick, he needs his, his oxygen. The gendarme will have none of it. Shut your mouth. Struggling to breathe, the old man nevertheless continues to demand, to protest, to curse. There are three disabled people here, he says angrily. His words evidently leave the officers unmoved. A short distance away, his wife, who is sick, is kneeling on the ground in front of the caravan next to her, their daughter-in-law, who a Zhejiang man has just brought, brought in, pulling her by the arm. At the side of the house, near the smoking barbecue, his younger son and his brother-in-law are, like him, lying flat on the asphalt, both with, with a boot, planted in their back. Standing beside them, officers point the barrel of their weapons at them. The others <clears throat> have entered the two buildings of, of, on the farm where the family live. If they find a door closed, they kick it open. They can be heard overturning furniture, throwing objects across the rooms. When they are finished with the houses, the caravans are searched in the same way. After several minutes of this crashing ab about, the gendarmes come back out to them, clearly annoyed. They have not found the one they were looking for. Where is he? Where is the fugitive, they roar. His relatives reply that they have no idea. What do they imagine? That they will give him, give him up to them? All at once, however, 
the father realizes that it would have been better to answer, to tell them he had gone off into the woods. They might have followed his false trail. He's sorry that he did not think of this in the moment. But it's too late to go back on himself. In any case, the Jane Jane men have now gathered in the middle of the courtyard. They are talking amongst themselves in low voices. They seem to be preparing to leave, if only. A noise in the shed. Angelo must have knocked something down. He must have thought they had left and wanted to move. A dull thud. But the gendarmes have heard it. Two of them advance with caution, followed by three others. They hold their submachine guns in their hands. The father tenses on the hard surface of the terrace. He would like to shout to his boy, give yourself up. But he thinks that, that it is what he will do anyway. He won't play the hero, it's not his style. The Zhejiang man shoved the, the door open with a crash. They go in. Almost immediately, a burst of gunfire. They empty their cartridge, clips, then a rattle, then nothing. His son had no firearms. It can be him that fired. So it was the cops. Without a word of warning, lying five yards away from the entrance to the annex, the father is sure. He has heard nothing except the shots, followed by a brief moan and the shout of a gendarme in the garden running toward the store. Hold fire! Stun grenade him! Now silence, oppressive. What has happened to his boy? Why are they bringing him out if they have captured him? Why do the gendarmes keep go coming and going and whispering conspiratorially among themselves? Why aren't they telling them anything? What are they hiding? One of them appears at the entrance of the lumber room. He's holding a cloth covered in blood. The father thinks he recognizes Angelo's t-shirt. He cries out, they've killed my boy. An officer orders him to be quiet. Hearing the terrible news, the brother a little further rises with a howl of despair. A kick in the back throws him back to the ground. The gendarmes combat boot holds him down, head under the barbecue. He protests vociferously to no avail. Now the second, an, an excerpt from the second chapter about the same scene as he told uh, it, uh, it happened. The first officer, he comes out of the caravan. He has just been searching on his own without result. Like the two others he has inspected in the courtyard, three men and two women who have been held by his colleagues and are now under guard. The men lying on the ground are handcuffed. The women kneeling are not, are not cuffed. They are not easy, easy, these people. They moan, they complain, they hurl abuse at you. Turning his head, the officer sees two of his colleagues go into the lean-to attached to the main building of the farmhouse. They shout out that they have found the target. An individual belonging to uh, the traveling community was absconded. Dangerous, they were told during the briefing for the operation. He may have a fi firearm. The officer even remembers talk about use of hard drugs, specifically cocaine. This potential risk was, at the, was the official justification for calling for the GGN because initially it was supposed to be the observation and surveillance group responsible for tracking the objective's movement that was supposed to deal with arresting him. But with gypsies, you never know. The target was therefore pinpointed using geolocalization, geolocation. They were informed that the man had gone to visit his parents that, that day. The decision was therefore taken to arrest him at his home. They were shown a slide with a map of the site and given the planned outline of the intervention. It consists of taking the family by surprise at lunchtime. Eight men are to enter the buildings, three are to take on the caravans, three others are to be positioned in the courtyard as support, and a final four are to take up position around the low wall of the premises to avoid risk of flight. There are also the gendarmes, the regular ones, who will stay a little behind. The officer is in the quarantine. 
like his colleagues, he's protected by his heavy bulletproof vest and wears a helmet with a reinforced vis visor over his balaclava. He's armed with a semi-automatic pistol with three clips of 15 cartridge each, a pump action shotgun, and a small battering ram in case they need to force entry. He also has four stun grenades, a smoke grenade, and a flare, the full panoply. The operation has gone according to plan, at least to begin with. Shortly after midday, the major received confirmation that the fugitive had just arrived at his parents' house. Surrounding access routes were blocked by local gendarmerie units. The little property situated at the end of the village was approached discreetly. The Zhejiang men arrived hidden in the back of an unmarked, unmarked truck. While others took, took up position at the four corners of the property, the remainder of the group formed up into assault, assault columns ready to enter the premises, each made up of three men, the first carrying a shield. The incursion into the court, a courtyard produced the intended effect of surprise. A gendarme shouted, police, everyone on the ground, uh, excuse me, police, every, everybody on the ground, hands on your head. Several officers uh, ran toward the people present in the courtyard. Two men standing by a barbecue, another old man uh, in front of the main building, a, a woman near the caravan and a child. During this time, the officer with, with two of his colleagues first entered into one of the farm's buildings and then investigating, investigated two caravans, nobody. They were then called toward one of the houses, still no tar trace of the target. When he returned to the center of the courtyard, the officer noticed that there was now a young woman among the adults being held under guard. He then entered the third caravan. It took him virtually no time to search the tiny space. The target was not hidden there either. It is as he comes out of the, into the courtyard that he sees his two colleagues enter a small annex and hears them call that they have found the target. He rushes in after them. As soon as he enters the lumber room, he sees by the laser light held by one of his colleagues, a bare-chested bare man crouched in the darkness, back to the wall, silent, facing them as they are pointing their guns at him. He hears one of them shout that the target has a knife and order and order him to drop it, but he does not see the weapons, the weapon himself. His two colleagues move back to avoid being stabbed. Another who entered the lean-to a little before him pulls out his taser and fires. The electric shock briefly immobilizes, immobilizes the individual who nevertheless gets up, pulls the wires out of his left hand and throws himself at the two Zhejiang men opposite him. There's a round of gunfire, then another round. The officer cannot make out what has just happened. He figures out that one of his teammates has been thrown to the ground and he hears a voice shouting, I've been hit. He thinks his colleague has taken a stray bullet, probably a friendly fire shot as sometimes happens. The man continues to advance, silent, threatening, his right arm raised. He rushes toward one of the gendarmes opposite him, pushes him uh, up against the wall, tries to hit him. He now walks toward the officer who, despite the short distance between them, has still not seen the knife, but assumes the individual carries one. He reacts immediately. He fires to, to stop him without warning a single bullet at short distance into the solar plexus. He sees blood flowing over the abdomen. The individual takes one more step, then collapses head first onto the bicycle. The officer puts away his weapon. The room is plunged into darkness once again, except for the wide beam of light coming from the entrance, which is partly blocked by his colleagues. He glimpses the the body lying at his feet. He leans down. The individual seems to be in bad shape. He's barely breathing. He gives a weak groan. With the help of his colleague, 
or a, a moment before was being threatened with a knife, the officer turns him over <clears throat> and hands, handcuffs him. The aim of the intervention was to arrest him. Job done. When he has finished uncuffing him, he thinks that the guy is all the same, not far from death. So I, I should just add <clears throat> that in all these uh, 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 all, all, all these chapters, <clears throat> I use the language that people use. So when I say gypsy, for example, or when I say the target, <clears throat> uh, that's the language used by the police. Or when uh, I say the cops, and in fact there are different words in French uh, to uh, or in the language of the uh, of the uh, travel travelers, uh, there are different ways of. Uh, talking about them, Th these, are, these are the words they, they, they use. So now in the final chapters of the book, the investigation becomes a counter investigation. I do again the work of the investigators, of the prosecutor and of the judges. I thus show not only the conflict between the versions of the parents and those of the gendarmes, which are expected, but also the incompatibility of the narratives of the five officers, for instance, some affirming that the opponent was yelling and others that he didn't say a word like we just heard now. Some saying that the man fell dead and others that after he was shot, he engaged in a rugby scrum with them. I also analyzed the inconsistency between the official, the official report with the data of the forensics. For instance, contrary to what the officer who shot several times say about the man standing above him, threatening as uh, he had himself fallen down uh, on the ground. The ballistic indicates that the bullet's path go downward <clears throat> in the thorax, meaning that the officer was above and the man was still hiding, squatting in a corner of the room. And contrary to what is known about the paralyzing effects of the tens of thousands of volts of taser charge, the frail man hit twice, it twice, supposedly at renewed vigor to attack with his pocket knife, five heavily equipped, protected, and armed officers. This lead me, leads me to a more general theoretical reflection on uh, police lies and judicial truth, so not just not in this case in particular, but in general, meant to enlighten all cases in which law enforcement agents are involved in cases of violence or death. So just again, <clears throat> a, a brief and last uh, excerpt. There are situations when lies prove especially necessary to law enforcement agents. These are the situations of what are commonly called blunders, but should more properly be termed simply violence. When brutality is perpetrated by gendarmes or police officers, the agent concerned, their colleagues and their superiors are easily tempted to conceal it or at least dress up the circumstances in which such, in, in, in such a way as to make it legally acceptable and hence not subject to criminal sanctions. Legitimate self-defense is the argument most often used. The lie works all the better if it is supported by consistent testimony from witnesses. Moreover, the recourses to a collective lie in case of cases of violence, particularly when it has led to the death of an individual, presents several advantages for police officers. First, it constitutes a, an obviously uh, efficacious uh, defense, making it possible to exonerate the perpetrators. The mildness of internal sanctions and the rarity of court convictions of officers directly or indirectly involved in the death of individuals are well documented. Second, it helps to reinforce solidarity within the group, since the witnesses show solidarity by adding their mendacious words to those of their colleagues directly involved, and all are then bound by uh, a sort of secret pact by the violation of their oath. And third, it protects the institution from the risk of damage to its public image, which partly explains why senior officers and even politicians up to the highest level of government in France 
are, are so ready to contribute to concealing the truth. It should be added that in the rare cases where officers report abuses commi committed by their colleagues to their superiors, it is they who find themselves sanctioned. Several of them, several of them wrote to me about uh, their, how they have been punished. Here again, both criminological studies and contemporary cases offer copious theoretical analysis and empirical evidence of this mechanism of collective lying. The falsification of the facts when violence has been perpetrated can even go beyond exoneration of the perpetrators. It can serve at the same time to incriminate the victims. This is facilitated by the offense of insulting and resisting a person investigating invest, invested by public authority, which has been rising uh, in France over the last 30 years. The perpetrator of violence accuses the person who has been subjected to it, claiming that the abusive and aggressive behavior of the individual concerned made it necessary to use force. In some cases, there may be a negotiated joint withdrawal of both complaints as the victim of violence comes on to understand the unfavorable, unfavorable balance of power in the judicial context. In others, the two complaints are pursued by the judge is generally more sensitive to the offense allegedly perpetrated against officers. It is thus clear that given, to, given all these practices taken together, victims of police violence have very little chance of seeing the harm done to them recognized and their rights upheld. In the United States, the institutionalization of false testimony is such that a common phenomenon is such a common phenomenon that there is a police slang term that demonstrates how routine and even acceptable it has become testilying, a hybrid word that obviously combines testifying and lying. Studies show that while citizen grand juries tasked with deciding whether the alleged perpetrator of a crime should be indicted, respond affirmatively in 99% of cases of homicide committed by an ordinary citizen, they return a negative response in 99% of cases where a, office, a police officer kills an individual, even unarmed. The fact that grand jury hearings and discussions take place under the guidance of the prosecutor, depending on them for cases and arrest of uh, suspects is not unconnected to these statistics. So if I combine and consider these two experimental dimension of, of the book, the, the writing and the, and the counter investigation, I tend to think um, uh, that the first part is constructed, of course, uh, not with the same talent, but uh, constructed like Rashomon, Akira Kurosawa's film, which offers four contradictory versions of a murder that took place in a forest and in which which they were all participants. And the, the, the second part carries something of the logic, again, not the, not the quality, but the logic of 12 angry men, Sidney Lumet's film in which a member of the jury progressively reverses the consensus of his colleagues also on a murder case. So between the two parts that I just described, there is a sort of interlude about Angelo's life and funerals, and about the legal and political battle of his family, especially his sister, to obtain truth and justice. An interlude that is important to me because it avoids representing Angelo as a criminal and his family as passive. And in the final chapter, based on the counter investigation, I give a reconstruction of the tragic event in, in place of the reenactment re that the prosecutor and judges had refused to do. And in the epilogue, I tried to imagine Angelo's last day and last moments. So these two <clears throat> uh, experiments, writing in multiple voices and carrying out a counter investigation are thus an attempt to show how what could merely be seen as a tragic incident can generate an interrogation about how ethnographies can be produced and what role the ethnographer may have in society. Because the point is not just to establish the very likely responsibility of the two officers in the killing of Angelo, it is also to render intelligible the process and the system 
in which they were involved and which led to such a disproportionate intervention, intervention, such a biased investigation and such an unfair decision. What is indeed at stake in my work is what this story reveals of the police extraordinary deployment of force to arrest a man who had only been sentenced for, to prison for minor offenses, of the justice system working when police violence is involved against minorities as is, as in the case, uh, as is the case in many contexts, and marginally of society's contempt toward and fear of Roma people, which accounts for the general indifference regarding the case. In this sense, it is a broader questioning, not only of police deviance and justice dysfunction, but also of racial stigmatization and discrimination toward travelers, which have deep historical roots in European societies. And ultimately, the book is an effort to restore something of what these communities of travelers are usually denied their respectability. But to finish, such endeavor is not without risks for the ethnographer. I soon, became, I soon became aware that using the documents I had in my possession was illegal. The violation of the secret of the judicial investigation is punished by a maximum of 45,000 euros fine. There's only one person who can authorize the use of these documents, the prosecutor. On one of my short visits to France, I went to the center of the country to meet with him. At the beginning of our conversation, conversation he told me that he had read Enforcing Order, the book on my ethnography of anti-crime squads, and I took this as a statement, meaning the end of my hopes to obtain his permission. But to my surprise, he added that he had liked the book. I then asked him whether he could share me, with me uh, the documents concerning the case, which in fact, I already had in my possession. He immediately accepted and searched in his computer to send them to me. A few minutes before I had, I had asked him whether I could record our conversation. He had agreed. I therefore had the evidence of his authorization which I indicated in the book by expressing my gratitude to him, anonymously, of course, so as to avoid potential attempts of the Gendarmerie or the Ministry of the Interior to file a case against me. However, sometime later, as I was correcting the proofs of the book, I discovered through a report of the lawyer consulted by the publisher that there was another legal issue, the risk of being accused of defamation of the police which is punished by a maximum of one year of imprisonment and 15,000 euro fine. Since my alternative version of the events not only implied that the officer, officers had lied, but also that the whole elite unit had coalesced to make up the story presented to the judges, this could be read as a calumny sullying the prestigious institution. There was, of course, not much that I could change into the book at, uh, as it was, not only because it was almost ready to go to fabrication, but also because the whole counter investigation was based on the idea that the testimonies were fallacious. At some point, I thought that I could rephrase my account by saying that what I was proposing was simply another interpretation or an alternative narrative. But I eventually decided that it would be to evade the crucial issues of police lies and justice bias. I therefore use the phrase ethnographical truth to name what I had produced. By this expression, I meant two things. First, that as in any ethnographic study, I had paid the same attention to everyone independently of their social status, which the prosecutor and the judges had not done as they had neglected the words of the parents. And second, as in any ethnographic study, again, I had used all the information available, interviews as well as documents, and taken, taken them as rigorously as possible, while the prosecutor and the judges had reoriented them, as I showed in the book, to fit their version of facts. Of course, 
I'm not thinking that my ethnographic truth is absolute. I was not at the scene, but I think that my account is as neutral and objective as I could make it. And I appeal in the end to the reader's intelligence to decide which of the so-called judicial truth and of my own ethnographic truth is the most plausible and what consequences that has in terms of comp comprehension of contemporary societies. Today, some of these readers of the uh, book are somewhat particular. Indeed, after the case was dismissed by the judge, then in appeal, and finally at the Court of Cassation, the family took it to the European Court of Human Rights, which recently accepted to examine it. In the file, several chapters of my counter investigation are included. The family hopes that it will be, it will be given reason, which would not imply that the officers would be tried. They are definitely, definitively exonerated, but that the French state would be condemned for its use of police force and the unfairness of its justice system with the obligation to give a financial compensation to the family for its members, this would mean that truth and justice ultimately would have prevailed. Thank you. Thank you so much for that incredibly eloquent uh, presentation, which I think gives us a really um, vivid sense of the, the book and its, its power. Um, so without further ado, but just reminding everybody that the Q&A where you can put your questions is, is open and please do, if you're like me, somebody who finds it hard to hold questions in your head, do feel to free to jot them down. I'll be reviewing them as we go, um, uh, your questions as the event proceeds. So uh, with thanks to Professor Fassin, I would like now to call on Christina Varbia with many thanks uh, to make her intervention. Hello everyone, um, and it is a pleasure to, to be here tonight and particularly to respond to Professor Fossin's um, work, which I have admired for a long time and, uh, and specifically to engage with this uh, very rich and thought provoking work, uh, which I've, I've enjoyed also reading uh, immensely. Um, Firstly, I wanted to, of course, uh, applaud uh, the commitment and the talent to study such a case uh, that is essentially crucial to, to kind of draw from in order to understand the way that justice is dis distributed. And also, um, as, as you have mentioned just now, the, this attempt to kind of restitute the respectability of Angelo and, uh, and his family. I will try to draw a little, a few parallels with forensic architecture's work, because I think there are a few, and um, and specifically because forensic architecture has led um, a few counter investigations in the absence of uh, state investigations, but also specifically in recognition uh, that state institutions are somehow unable or inadequate in examining themselves. Uh, and in attributing accountability to their own organs and um, uh, when it comes to uh, when they have done something wrong when they when there has been such a case of um, of violence in particular uh, forensic architecture has done a series of investigations on police killings uh, in the uk as uh, as you mentioned, uh, in uh, the USA, in Israel, in Greece, and, and elsewhere. And although each of the contexts varies significantly and uh, institutional power somehow crystallizes differently in each case, there are a series, series of common threads running across, um, across uh, cases of police violence, as well as um, on the aftermath of that violence when very often institutions work to conceal the evidence um, and exonerate the actors involved. So I will I will draw specifically on on one particular case, uh, which I I find has many interesting kind of uh, points, and and kind of also highlight a little bit um, the ways that that this compare with Angelo's case and and in the work of this book. So Yal Weizmann, the director of forensic architecture, notes that in most of those cases. The legal defense used um, is that of a split second, 
an indivisible unit of time, which is dominated by instinct rather than due process or fair judgment. The split second offers a strong defense for police officers because all they have to prove essentially is that they are legitimately that they legitimately believed that they were under threat at that moment and thus the violence used was justified as self defense. So in the investigation of uh, the killing of uh, Harith Augustus, who was a, a black barber from the south shore of Chicago who was killed by Chicago police officers uh, for because he was carrying a gun while he was uh, moving from, he was walking from his home to the barbershop where he worked. The superintendent of the police um, used this excuse of a split second in the press conference that followed the killing. He specifically said, decision to use lethal force is made in a split second, and it is based on the safety of the officer and also the surrounding community. So in response to this kind of very explicit statement, we conducted an investigation in six parts uh, in the chapters that we called milliseconds, seconds, minutes, hours, days, and years. And in this way, we sought to deconstruct this imper impermeable split second and seek to understand how a killing of a man whose sole mistake was carrying a gun in the state of Illinois, a state that allows the carrying of concealed weapons, can be understood through those different temporal lenses. I mentioned this investigation specifically because uh, it was through this frame that we happened to collaborate with a neuroscientist from Imperial College, uh, uh, Professor Tiago Branco, who helps us understand the way that a split second decision comes to be within the brain. So Tiago Branco explained that each of us depends on a, on a sort of, um, on a notional world model in order to make our decisions day to day. So this world model, model is comprised of every experience we ever had. And um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it includes all the films we ever watched, the images and texts we read and all the conversations we, we have had. And so to make decisions, we simulate possible scenarios in order to, to assess what is the better option at any given moment. But within a split second, there is not enough time for this process to run its course. And so if the police officers act as judges, so to speak, at this moment, there is not enough time for due process. They rather depend on instincts and very often biases that, um, that are further compromised by the cultural stereotypes that the subject that these people have been subjected to. So that's a, a sociological analysis, like the one that uh, Professor Fosson has done here in this book is more than pertinent. And uh, particularly, I, I also highlight that uh, this, this discussion on the construction of truth versus the construction of lies uh, that, that weaves together philosophy, sociology, political science in the book is, is incredibly strong. And I, I really kind of advise everyone to, to have a look at at that and, um, and offer the reflections as well. I note uh, multiple parallels between the, the killing of Harith Augustus and the case of Angelo's death, which I think as it is framed in this, in this event, it is rather a killing rather than, I think it's, it's uh, proper to, to characterize it as a killing rather than death um, in abstract. Um, but the fact that uh, this killing is not an extraordinary case, but rather it is quite commonplace as, as it is noted in the book. The judicial process of, uh, for the killing of Harith Augustus is still ongoing and, uh, we were, um, and we're still waiting to see what happens, but we were advised very early on by very competent lawyers that this is a case where the police will most probably be acquitted because there is a moment when Harith, while fleeing from the police who had kind of cornered him, uh, might be seen touching his gun. This is enough to render him as an offender. And so it is necessary to look at these cases that form the norm to really examine in this case uh, and in the book, I think, what is it that we accept as lawful and therefore justified? What is it that we are happy as a society to, to accept uh, as something that we, we are okay with? In the case of Harith, as in the case of Angela, the officer who fired uh, his gun had not shot a person before. In fact, uh, both of the officers who grabbed, uh, also the officer who grabbed Harith and cornered him, 
and I will show a little bit of, of that incident, uh, escalating the events in such a way. And the officer who, who shot, the, who shot the, the gun, who in fact killed him, uh, were still in the probationary period. And I think this is also kind of common. It was noted in the book that, that these are younger officers that, that have not uh, experienced maybe um, such uh, intensity in the past. And so this further points to a policing mistake rather than um, kind of um, something that, that uh, legitimately uh, is understood as, as a threat, because when we compare this with the reaction of more experienced police officers, they don't seem to, to find it as, uh, as high stakes as a situation. And, um, and essentially, I thought the, the, the other, um, I have a few more notes. The one is that the construction of the defense of the police officers begins at this very moment when the killing takes place. Uh, it is not that this concealment doesn't take any delay. In the case of Horitha Augustus, the first thing that the officer who has fired the gun says as soon as he activates his body camera is shots fired at the police, which is very soon after found to be simply untrue. There were no shots fired at the police. Most importantly, um, I think the, um, we share forensic architecture, the forensic architecture team, I think share very much with Professor Fassin this understanding that in order to counter a version of events, um, it is necessary to, to conduct an analysis of the evidence and testimony I knew. So within, with this kind of last part, I wanted to, um, to kind of uh, conclude my remarks by showing you some, uh, some of the ways that, that we have been doing this. Um, because I think there's also a, a, a small difference um, or, or a significant maybe difference in our approaches here. I think the book is very successful in its approach in, in assuming different standpoints and examining facts from different perspectives. But, but of course, uh, it, is, it is a book. Right, and I think the way that we that forensic architecture has used uses different mediums and models is something that I would like to discuss um, in particular. So similar to the magistrate who ordered the full reconstruction, our approach usually recognizes that spatial and temporal questions can help immensely in clarifying contradictions and consistencies and incoherences, as are mentioned in the book. So here I will very shortly uh, share my screen just in order to uh, show you this uh, footage. Um, yes. So when it is not possible to visit the scene in order to reenact the alleged versions of events, we depend on three-dimensional models, which bring together different types of evidence and allow this to be investigated spatially as well as temporally. The non-linear nature of a model allows for an open investigation where multiple pieces of evidence can be examined together at once. And of course, as uh, Professor Fassin remarks, this sort of reconstruction is easier when there is body camera footage of the incident, which was the case here in, in the killing of Horitha Costas. So we did have body camera footage, uh, which uh, you can see from these videos. And please note that that there is uh, quite uh, graphic footage that is about to play in just now, as well as uh, CCTV footage and later uh, and a later kind of camera that was discovered from dash camera footage from dash camera um, from a car. So I'm, I'm showing you here the way that models are used in in our own practice and. Um, and this is the video that was used specifically in order to defend the account of the police that said that this was a legitimate killing because, because Horace Augustus was carrying a gun and briefly touched it. So although the evidence um, does greatly assist with analyzing the events, it does not wholly solve the problem of truth. I would argue that it rather displaces it within the field of media representation. When watching body camera footage, the viewer identifies with the perspective of the police officer. We connect with their minor gestures, with tremble, the trembling of their body when running, with the anxiety of their every move. What's more, we see objects and people coming at us. And thanks to the wide lens of such cameras, the perception of threat is exaggerated as distances collapse. Legal scholars have called this perspectival, perspectival bias. In fact, after repeated freedom of information requests, 
excuse me, and even a lawsuit against the um, Civilian Office of Police Accountability, a final video was released, excuse me, a final video was released describing the events of Harith's killing, which was from a dash camera placed in a car parked right in front of the site of the killing. As you can see here, the officer uh, firing the shots is rendered much more aggressive than uh, from the perspective of the body camera footage. So it is, it is quite interesting that it was this footage that was kept from public view uh, when the events happened. And finally, uh, we kind of uh, have a similar instinct to Professor Fosin, who concludes the book with attempting to give the speculative account of Angelo. Uh, at this moment, we also attempted to even out the representational field, so to speak, and offer a speculative visualization of what would Harith have seen during his own shooting. This model helps us to do this, uh, to inverse the forensic gaze, so to speak, to not even the forensic gaze to inverse the gaze and the and the and the kind of the representational frame here we've slowed down um this this moment to show how how it is it is a moment of threat uh, it's felt as a moment of threat for for her himself so just to close this uh, short remarks i wanted to perhaps uh, ask professor professor fasin to reflect on the um, process of doing this sort of counter investigative work as well as the work of reconstruction on the format of the book, which um, on the one hand necessitates a certain linearity, as well as relies on kind of textual descriptions of spaces and temporal quality. So we need to describe them rather than see them. But perhaps what the book allows us to do is to follow the investigative process and the logic closely in a way that may feel that we are doing the work with you. So I think if I may propose a, a certain kind of reading of, of this uh, kind of uh, great piece of work is to say that the way that the book is structured, assuming different perspectives and, um, and allowing us to examine things from, from multiple different viewpoints, make such accounts open. So it's in fact, is a little bit less linear to, to what a book usually is. And if I may propose so, it seems to be acting also as a model. It becomes spatial almost as we are asked to adopt those different positions and thread together different uh, frames and filters through which to, to understand and read this event. And uh, so I, I think I, I would leave it to that and, uh, and ask perhaps for your own reflections about uh, how the process of conducting and putting together this work in this format has had both its challenges and its kind of um, different ways of, um, of opportunities. And I'm really excited also to hear about uh, the way that it might be uh, admitted and presented within the European Court of Human Rights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. And uh, Richard, can I now just simply hand over to you? Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. I'm, I'm delighted to be here this evening um, to offer some reflections on Death of a Traveller. It is a powerful book. It is a, it is a dignity restoring book. Um, it rises emotions as much as it does intellectual thoughts. Um, Professor Fassan takes us on a unique kind of counter investigation, as he calls it, and, and I think boasts a really rich sociological deconstruction and then reconstruction of the killing of Angelo at the hands of the police. But at the same time, it provides space for the currents of emotion of his family, their loss, their hurt, their indignity, their indignation to swirl around this, uh, this book. Um, this, the, the tragic story that, that lies at the heart of, of the book is described by Fassan in the preface as a simple one. And perhaps it's, it's simple insofar as the events it interrogates in such detail happened over just a matter of, of minutes, even seconds, or it's, it's simple in the sense of its familiarity, um, as Christina was, was saying. Um, that's to say, you know, the kinds of facts and issues surrounding Angelo's um, bear the hallmarks of, of fiddle encounters between ethnic minority and marginalized groups and the police um, in many jurisdictions, which um, I, I, I'm sure audience members are, are drawn from. 
And yet this is really, I think, far from a simple book in other respects. Um, to, to describe it, to make sense of it, to, 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 do, justice to, to, to do justice to it this evening. Um, the reader is invited to hear through the book's protagonists an intimate account of a family at their most vulnerable and the police at their most powerful. On the one hand, the engaged reader, like its investigative author, is tasked with paying careful attention to the finest details of events as told from the vantage point of its multiple protagonists. But on the other hand, the powerful contextualization of the specific events surrounding Angelo's death calls on the reader to exercise agility, I think, too, to juggle in their minds these macro-level forces of harsh penal policies, social prejudices and discrimination, but also meso-level features of police and prosecutorial culture, ways of, of um, their ways of working that contribute to this institutional duplicity. And, and of course, the rich micro-level experiences of Angelo and his family's interaction with each other and the various manifestations of the state that they encounter both before and after his death. Um, and, and the book culminates in, in a pointed, highly persuasive account, I think, of, of what might really have happened to Angelo in the dark shed that day. The ethnographic truth, as Professor Fan is, is, uh, Fassan is, is searching for. In, in my modest contribution uh, this evening, I, I want to reflect on, on two recurring thoughts that, that animated my reading of the book. Um, and, and maybe a third, uh, I'll touch on if I have time, I'll see how I'm doing. Um, and, and I hope that that might, might foster some discussion from the panel and the audience. So the first thought that I had throughout the book, uh, what I found really fascinating was how legal consciousness enters and leaves the accounts of the book's protagonists. So it seemed to me there's a whole variety of, of seemingly contradictory ways in which law is presented, understood and relied upon by the book's characters. And this, this really interests me as, as someone that, that studies the, this relationship between law and policing. So if we start with the state actors, uh, the gendarme and the, the public prosecutor, there's a striking presence of law in enabling police action, even lethal violence. Uh, and you mentioned how um, after the, the terrorist attacks in Paris in 2015, a state of emergency uh, gave law enforcement more prerogatives from 2017 legal expansion of the self-defense doctrine in France, permitting recourse to potentially lethal force specifically against escaped persons uh, and, and those who might make attempts on the, on the life or bodily integrity of office, officers. Um, I could speak um, at length, but I won't, about the legal construction of defence here in England and Wales um, and, and how that has um, enabled this defence to run so easily but based on an honest and genuine belief with the objective standard, the reasonless standard that belongs to the civil law having fallen away from domestic law. But also we see, uh, if anything, a backtracking from the European Court of Human Rights on, on what Article 2 requires um, by way of justification. Um, and there's a live issue right now here in England and Wales. The Court of Appeal has recently um, held that the use of force standard for internal professional disciplinary standards is an objective one. It requires not, not an unreasonable belief. Belief must be honestly held unreasonable. So we have this curious situation in which the internal police standards are more exacting than the criminal law standards for self-defense. But I, I'll, I'll leave that leave that there. The, the other presence of law and enabling police violence is, is uh, as, you, as you mentioned this evening, the reliance on prosecutors um, on bringing charges against a person injured by police action. And in some cases, a bargaining chip in others to counterbalance the charge against the officer. And, and this results, um, as Professor Fassan summarizes in the book, um, that, that the judicial process generally ends with the dismissal of the case and the exoneration of the officers charged. And for the, the officers themselves, they know that when they do abuse their authority during an intervention with this community, there will be no consequences. But here comes the curious twist for me, because having said all of this, the law undoubtedly has a presence, a status, that invites a degree of reverence in the accounts of the gendarmes and the prosecutors. In my reading of the book, I didn't hear accounts of unfettered power and impunity, but of actors operating in the shadow of the law in some way. The law's presence lurked in a fashion that could be permissive and sympathetic to officers, but also unpredictable, a potential source of, of in-the-job trouble. 
The first officer, for example, is convinced that his shot has caused Angelo's death, and he's no doubt that he will have to justify his actions not only to his superiors, but also in a court. Indeed, the motivation for the lies purportedly told by the gendarmes is a fear of the court conviction that would result from a failed attempt at mounting self-defense. So too, of course, are the first and second officer taken to police custody and presented with a charge sheet that indicates um, there are plausible reasons for suspecting manslaughter, and then they're placed under formal investigation. The gendarmes interpret this as recognition that the police and prosecutor's version of events um, has been rendered problematic by the examining magistrate. So if you keep with this thread of the presence of the law and these kind of contra contradictory uh, manifestations of, of, of consciousness, um, and we move to Angelo's family, the law's presence and, and their position alongside it also seems multifaceted, even contradictory. So in my reading of the book, I saw the family to use uh, Sylvia Newick's terminology as simultaneously before, with, and against the law at different times. So they're before the law substantively during the, the deeply humiliating search of their home. Procedurally, they have to be patient. They have to wait for the formal investigation to run its course. Uh, both the first and the second examining magistrates. As you say in the book, they have to wait, or as they say in the book, they have to wait. There's not much more they can do from a legal point of view. They remain respectful of the legal context, a procedure in whose independence they want to believe. But they're also against the law. The father's raw physical challenge to the purported legitimate use of force um, and formally authorized search of the family's house uh, in, in publicizing that the first gathering in Angelo's memory, it's held outside the criminal court gathering to demand justice and truth. And again, uh, we see Angelo's father putting an end to the police interview or the interview with the criminal investigator when questioned less about the traumatic event and the bad character of their son. But again, they're in a different position with the law at another stage that they're, they're with the law at times as well. So Angelo's father spoke um, to Angelo on the phone and advised him to return to the prison out of a respect for the law. Angelo's sister and younger brother set out for Paris to instruct counsel to challenge the judicial truth. They're now appealing to um, the, the European Court of Human Rights, the legal system, to, 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 for, for redress. And what I find fascinating is how, despite being before and against the law, there remains an enduring sense, a, a glimmer of hope, as it's described in the book, that the judicial truth might yet recognize a different version of his death. So there's this desire to be with the law, to invest in and seek to deploy the power of a system that persistently wrongs them, dehumanizes them, reifies prejudices and discrimination. And, and Professor Fassan suggests, uh, explains why this might be so, because the judicial truth has a striking performative power. It articulates a truth retained by history and held by the majority of society as you describe it in the book. But this left me trying to make two, sense of two things. The first is how the judicial truth has managed to retain its moral authority at all. Its ability to speak with virtue for Angelo's family and the wider traveling community, given the dark, dark underbelly of, of the system that they witness and they know to continue to be in existence through their routine interac interactions with police in the penal state. The second thing that I was left trying to make sense of, and it's closely related, is the extent to which the voice of the law, the judicial truth, and its, its modes of knowing, of investigating, but, it, but also um, of speaking truth, um, could, could really recognize the indignity, or to put it differently, restore the dignity for Angelo, but also his family's gross treatment that day, and the pains of the process of the investigation that follow. For me, as a reader, I find great dignity instead in the peaceful campaigns and, and the tenacity of Angelo's sister. When they go high, we go low, as Michelle Obama said, that, 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 that phrase came, came to mind. But also in the very narration of Angelo's family by Professor Fassan through the book, this is a dignity restoring book because it hears his family. It elevates their version in a way not available within the judicial truth. The book bears witness to the indignities they endured. And then it doesn't rest there. It makes the prosecution case that they never managed to make because the charge was never brought. The 
second um, point uh, thought thought really that that, that um, occurred to me in, in reading the book is the power of criminal justice actors to prompt and convey identity laden sense making for those that encounter the state. So sense making here I'm thinking about how people socially construct what they do, why they do so and, and what effect it has in, in, in specific settings. And it's a process um, in which individuals are reflecting on phenomena to, to enact the social world, constituting it through description, communication. Um, and to make sense of something is to embark, embark um, as the sense-making scholars suggest, a search for plausibility and coherence that's reasonable and memorable, that maintains the self whilst being able to resonate with others. Um, so sense making is, is this ongoing process, intimately bound up with identities, influenced by our personal bio biographies and beliefs, as well as wider aspects of culture and norms. And I think in the book we see a kind of sense making and identity at play when it comes to Angela's family, uh, how the police and prosecutors treat them signals in a profound and deeply damaging way how the state and society perceives them and the type of treatment um, that, that, that they're worthy of. The, actions, remarks, and descriptors used by the police and prosecutors towards Angelo's family uh, really reek of, of indignity, of, of inhumanity. As Angelo's mother recounts picturing the damage that's done to the house search by police when they came looking for Angelo, and I quote here, you can't treat people and things like that. What are they supposed to have done wrong? What do they want? They've been given no explanation, only instructions yelled at them, as if they didn't deserve to be talked to normally like human beings. Her position is stressful, painful. She complains that her knees hurt. Nobody listens to her. It's a whole five hours before the family are informed of Angelo's death. They're the last to be told, they're lied to. The family are then refused psychological support um, as is conveyed in the book. They're, they're, they're not innocent victims, but they're, they're guilty ones. They, they feel dehumanized throughout this book throughout the process that, that, that and the accounts given in the book and and strikingly and again being with the law it, it's it's not until they meet the lawyer in Paris that they, they encounter someone that, that treats them as human um, and and this tells Angelo's family of their position in society it confirms their sense of the prejudices held against them as members of the traveling community uh, in, the, in the words of, of, of Ian Luder um, and, and Walker uh, in their work on, on sociology of policing and, and its relationship with the nation state, they, they suggest that the police provide an iconography of the nation state. They express a, a collective national identity, which is strongly linked to community and belonging. Um, and the police can operate as a condensation symbol for wider sensibilities and fears. Um, or to use it, the procedural justice parlance, that these are teachable moments. Um, they're lessons which, which, which are really clear for Angelo's family. The, 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 the denigration, stigmatization, marginalization of travelers, as, as you recount in, in the book. Um, and in a line that really reverberates uh, towards the end of the book, the racism towards them that permeates the whole of society is the ultimate sociological cause of Angelo's death, just as much as the fatal shots. But I think an account of sense making an identity uh, need not, ought not stop there. So I was, I was left wondering how the gendarmerie themselves make sense of their actions that day. How those that pulled the trigger or placed their heavy boots on, on the backs of Angelo's family, uh, of his parents, how they have necessary repair their own self-identity as those wielding legitimate power, as embodying an institution that claims to be and must truly perceive itself to be a virtuous one. And I wonder if we can use the concept of sense-making and its connection with identity, link it up with powerful actors, desire, and I suspect need for self-legitimacy to explain three specific dimensions of the police account towards the end of the book. So, the first is the um, indignity meted out against the family, which um, Fassan suspects um, the, the gendarmerie just can't understand. The second is the surprising descriptions given by the officers of how they apparently displayed 
um, friendly and benevolent attitudes toward Angelo's family, as well as their strictly technical and neutral language in describing what the family experienced to be a cold-blooded execution. Uh, and finally, their motivation for lying about Angelo's behavior and the gendarmerie's actions in the immediate moments leading up to his death. So just to, just to finish up, Professor Fasson's explanation for these, these three aspects of the police account lies, uh, uh, police lies, is the, is the rationality that would appear to lie behind them. So the officers have uh, an interest to lie to protect themselves and the persons close to them. Um, but might it also be the case, assuming these officers are not sociopaths, that the three aspects just described there are not just rational ploys to stay out of prison or fend off formal complaints, but also a determined effort to clean up their dirty work, as, as, as Hughes, Hughes' term, um, that uh, to bolster their self-esteem, to embark on a search for plausibility and coherence that's reasonable and memorable, that maintains herself but resonates with others. And in this sense, it, sense making is driven more by plausibility than it is accuracy. It's a relative approach to truth. Um, people believe what they can account for, not only in terms of their sensory experience, but what's also emotionally appealing and consistent with their identities. So those are the two recurring thoughts um, that, that came that came to mind in, in this in this wonder, wonderfully rich and provocative book. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Richard, and what a wonderful pair of, of comments on your, your presentation, uh, Didier. So I had intended, um, Didier, to give you a chance to come back immediately, but we, we have very little time left. We've got two fabulous uh, questions in the, in the Q&A. So if you don't mind, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read those questions out and then give you the last few minutes just to respond in so far as it's possible in the time available. So first we have a, a question, thank you from, and, from Andrew Sellers in Derby. We hear about deaths at the hands of police forces across Western nations year after year, and every time it's against young males from minority groups. Is there something deeper at play in European and American societies that puts these young minority group males in situations that result in their deaths over and above just blaming the police forces pulling the trigger? Very big and very important question. And can then, you, can, you, can you, excuse me, can you repeat the, the question, the very question? Yes, sentence? I can. In fact, Didier, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy it into the chat so you can have a look at it. Um, so while I'm doing that, um, I'm so sorry, take you one second. Um, I will, I hope we can cut and paste. Yes. There we are. <coughs> Then the second question, uh, I think one you'll be very familiar with from Michelle Joan from Lyon, who is a, uh, an English and French law student here in London. Was it hard to keep an objective eye during the investigation and writing process? Or did leaving space for subjectivity allow you to be more sharp and critical in analyzing the inconsistencies of the case? So, Didier, with, with thanks yeah. and apologies for the small amount of time, the last five minutes is all yours. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, thank you very much for uh, these. Uh, uh, what, uh, especially from uh, Christina and uh, and Richard, what I see really as comments, uh, which I would like uh, to have the time to not only to to answer but but to to read, <laughs> and uh, and if you can send them to me, I, I will be very happy because they are extremely extremely rich. Um, so uh, trying to be uh, very uh, very quick. Um, of of course, I. I have a great admiration uh, uh, for the work that has been done by uh, forensic architecture and the power it has as being images that you can show on a on, on you know in a few minutes um, and, and which, which has been imitated as you know uh, by uh, in, in a uh, in a very good way uh, by other uh, um, 
media. Uh, I think Le Monde recently, I think, was uh, did something about the killing of a young man uh, in a, a, a housing estate uh, in France. Uh, and, and in that case, what was interesting is that, it, because as you, remember, you, you reminded us, uh, there's no uh, body cameras. So it's the, 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 um, the, the, the smartphone that people use from uh, the balconies. And that's where, that's how they can do the work that, that you've been, uh, that you've been doing, um, <clears throat> which, which is also something very, very interesting to, to, to think about. Um, I, I think that the, the book um, is, first of all, it's the only thing I can, I know how to do <laughs> is writing books and articles. Um, and, uh, uh, and I, you know, I've, even when I wrote the book on, on, uh, enforcing order, I was, um, uh, I was thinking of, about the series, the wire, and I wrote an article, uh, about the uh, comparing, comparing fiction and, and ethnography and showing that in two or three minutes, you can, uh, give a sense to the, uh, to, to, to the person who watches the series um, of some things that you need uh, five pages to describe in, in the book. Uh, and, and most people will not even read the book. So um, whereas, they, whereas they watch the, the, the Wire, that's one of the reasons uh, why I was so excited in, uh, in, write, in, uh, in writing um, uh, um, a graphic, what I call an ethnographic, which is the equivalent of a graphic novel uh, about uh, my work on 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 policing. Um, the um, I, I would I would like to uh, add one thing that I didn't develop uh, in 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 my talk, and perhaps not enough in the book either. I, I mentioned it, but it's so, there's something structural about the GIGN. So uh, and this kind of uh, units that are created all over the world. You create units for, uh, I mean, the government creates units uh, for exceptional situations of uh, terrorist attacks or hostage uh, taking. Uh, but of course, this does not happen every day. Um, and, uh, and, and so you have to keep these uh, officers who are very high level officers, you have to keep them Acting, so you so you you have to diversify their activities, uh, and when you diversify it, you don't diversify it uh, towards uh, white collar uh, uh, criminality. You uh, you go to to situations uh, where uh, where it's um, uh, where it's uh, uh, um, where it's easier to, uh, to 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 make this kind of. Uh, uh, of actions without having any uh, consequences, um, uh, and in in fact, the fact that we had one G uh, GIGN in France, and now we have, I think, uh, one national, but uh, four or five regional, uh, means that you multiply the situation in which you you can use these units. Uh, the prosecutor told me I didn't want to insist too much because I didn't want to put him in a difficult situation uh, by what I was writing. But the prosecutor told me that he didn't understand why they used the GIGN. Nobody understood why they used that. But the, the reason is has to do with what uh, Richard was saying is the way you consider these people. And you, you know, that's, uh, so one, one officer uh, was not involved in that said, that's their training. Uh, <clears throat> there's something of uh, it was not tip it was not exactly a training but but it is the way you can use this population to uh, to to do your this kind of uh, of training um i <clears throat> i very much appreciate everything that um uh, uh, um, richard has uh, said about um uh, about the different uh, position Especially of the family regarding the law, uh, the uh, uh, before, uh, uh, against, and and uh, and with the law, there's also a chronology in that, because uh, in the in the first in the first moment they are before the law, uh, they're humiliated and and, and cannot move and etc. Then there's a second moment where they're very much against and they don't even want to speak to the uh, to the investigators. Uh, 
uh, and go to 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 do the uh, the, uh, the their um, statements. Um, um, and uh, but 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 progressively and in a few days, they understand that they're the only way they would have to uh, change this is is with the law. Uh, they, and, and this is extremely interesting because uh, in similar cases in the past, what uh, what happened was that uh, we have several is that uh, the uh, travelers go to the street, destroy things, uh, uh, maybe set fire uh, uh, to the uh, uh, to, 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 to the, uh, the the police uh, station. And that's it. And and more more of them are uh, sentenced to, uh, to 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 prison. And and in that case, uh, after a few days um, or two days, uh, the uh, the sister said to to the family, to the relatives, to the friends, uh, we must not do that. We must show that we're uh, uh, we're dignified. And and then and that's why she re, they uh, avoid and there's a very str strong message to avoid any form of violence, and they go to the law and they and they get this uh, really remarkable um, uh, lawyer who is who is specialized in uh, the defense of people who have been uh, victims of police uh, police violence. So so I I very uh, I, I find this uh, very interesting, and. <clears throat> um, and of course, uh, it would be very interesting to, and that's why I, I would have liked to, to to talk to the police officers. And and you, it is it is it was impossible. And I understand why it is impossible. I mean, probably if I were in their uh, in their stead, I would not have wanted to, to talk to to an ethnographer uh, when things were uh, uh, in the process of being finished with the justice system. So so you, of course I understand that. I I, I don't blame them for for that. What I what I can what is interesting is um, and I didn't necessarily detail all that is there's a difference between the two officers. There's one who has the second one who is uh, was been brutal in the past or, or already, um, uh, and you see that he enjoys do, he's not not necessarily cruel, but but he, he enjoys you know using his weapon and the the, the first one uh, the one who killed or, or he says uh, killed so all this every time is what they say, it's not what I'm saying. So he says, I probably killed him. Um, and, uh, and at some point he starts to cry in, the, in front of the investigators. So you, you see by these details uh, and they're very indirect details that, uh, that, that, the, the situa that, that they are different. And, uh, <clears throat> but as you, as you say, they have to uh, and that's what I showed in my book because I was on the other side. I was with the with the police, and you've you've done uh, yourself uh, work on the police, so you you know you know the how they justify. The, they have to justify their actions, and I, I even said in my book Enforcing Order that they have to to have moral justification to what they do, and the moral justification is the denigration of those they are in front of them as being hostile, as being criminal, or as being accomplices. And the fact that the justice system is not doing its work, so the judges uh, free people after they've been uh, arrested, so they have to do to to, to do this justice industry. In in the, in the case of death of a traveler, uh, it's it's a mistake. I mean, they, they didn't want to kill the, 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 this man. Um, uh, uh, but, but then then they have to clean up, as you said, they have to clean up the, the job. Now, uh, very briefly, the the two. Um, uh, the the, the 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 two questions, uh, I think they they seem to, uh, in a way, um, uh, 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 throw a slight suspicion <laughs> on the case and on the uh, on the uh, on the author. Uh, <clears throat> so um, so on 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 the, on the case, uh, that's I think the first question, if I understand it well. Um, there, this is where I, I show that there's an imaginary of uh, and a fear of the travelers, uh, which is uh, really not justified uh, because the 
uh, it's extraordinarily rare that a traveler or Roma person would attack a police officer. Uh, and and in in the case of uh, 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 in the case of um, um, of Angelo, uh, the, in his in his background, there's no such it, it, no such situation. Uh, so it was stealing, uh, and in in one case when he was uh, when he was taken, he, he, he gave a he had a, a, a tool in his hand and he gave a. a, a, a uh, he knocked uh, the hand of the person of the officer who wanted to to stop him to run away. So, but but he didn't use a firearm. But but you see in the uh, in the preparation, and I I, I didn't d detail it here, but I I, I I do it in other chapters. Um, in the preparation, the mental preparation by the officers, by the by the, by the officials of, of the in in the is to say that he may be dangerous, he might, ha he might have a weapon, um, he might be under cocaine, and, and this is uh, really, uh, uh, and, and that's what they will try to prove then in the, the, um, uh, in, in, in the, um, uh, the forensic uh, and the biology and et cetera. Uh, th that he was under under cocaine, and they want to show that that he has uh, he has, a, he has a knife. Really, the knife is uh, is ten centimeter long, you know, and that's that's the knife that you uh, you know you you may you may have uh, if you you know if you go uh, uh, and want to to uh, to prepare a sandwich or something. You you go on Sunday, and and that's that's the kind of knife. It's 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 not it's not a it's not a, ser a serious weapon. They could use it seriously, of course, but so. So I think that uh, uh, in the case of, uh, of of the of the travelers, even the um, the police officers I, I worked with during fifteen months for my book Enforcing Order, what they were saying is that uh, they, they hated the Arabs, they hated the blacks, uh, but but for the the Roma people, they said at least with them we know that first of all they will not try to rebel, and second that they will admit. Uh, when when they're taken, so they, they will run away. But if they're taken, they, they will uh, they will accept. So so it's not it's really the construction uh, by uh, by the JEJN to justify the intervention that leads to their being uh, very nervous and 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 shooting when uh, when they when they see someone moving in the in the dark. Um, the, the second question um, is about the uh, the objectivity of the author. Uh, so, uh, so of course, as I said, I uh, I thought that the story was implausible when I read it. I, I thought that it was implausible. It was it was very difficult to to um, to, to imagine that, that things had happened as the police officers were saying. But I took the time to do all the interviews I could on both sides. Uh, uh, and, uh, and of course, not, not the police officers themselves, but, but I, have, uh, uh, I have hours and hours of their uh, the, uh, statements uh, to their investigators. So that's really what they said. And this is, what I, uh, what I, that this is why I wanted at the beginning to say, well, we have all these perspectives. We have all these... Uh, 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 and that, uh, and that goes to um, uh, what Christina was saying. The perspectives are, are, are extremely important, and I wanted, even if I had my idea that uh, some of them were lying, uh, I wanted to at least uh, tell the tell the reader this is what people say, and this is their their truth, or at least the truth they want us to believe, and. <clears throat> And I thought that was a way of treating them honestly, um, all of them. Um, and, uh, and, and I, I think that very often uh, that's the niche, Nietzschean uh, view. And uh, uh, although in that case, it's, it's a little more complicated. Uh, that's what Nietzsche says about perspective, what, what we call perspectivism. He says, each of us have a different perspective. Uh, but what he says, is what he adds, and very few people refer to the, the last 
part of the of the of the quote he says but when you multiply these perspectives you have something of an objectivity he uses and very surprising uh, in uh, under under uh, Nietzsche's um, uh, in, in Nietzsche's writing he uses the word objectivity so <clears throat> so so I think there's uh, both in uh, in the confrontation of these different versions and on the use of the documents so the, what I said about the ballistics and, and all that uh, you can produce something something that uh, <clears throat> is uh, more objective than what uh, what each uh, uh, character in the, in the in the story, especially those who killed, uh, wants us to believe. Uh, uh, and <clears throat> but but in the end, as I say, I refer to uh, the reader's uh, intelligence and and uh, uh, and uh, 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 critical sense. To, to, to think that uh, they agree with one side or with the other. And, uh, uh, and, and I think that's uh, as, as honest as I could be, uh, but, <clears throat> but, but, I, but it's true that I, from the beginning, I thought that it was, uh, it was impossible that the story of the police officers was, was the, the, describing what was happening, what had happened. And second, I should, I should add that if I had found uh, and that's what I had told the, the, the family at the beginning. If I, if I had found that Angelo uh, was really attacking them in a dangerous way and, and in fact that they were really in danger, I'm not sure, well, I, no, I'm, I'm sure I would not have written the book. I, not, I would not have written the book because it wouldn't have made sense if it just to, to tell the story that, uh, that the judges have said it doesn't make sense. Uh, so, yeah, that that's uh, and that's where I think uh, there's something in between politics and ethics in a, in a kind of work like this one. Well, very sadly, we're we're out of time. Indeed, we've overrun. I think that's really testimony to the incredible interest and quality of your presentation of the two panelists and the questions we've had. Um, I recommend the book to everybody. It's, it's been a wonderful discussion. There is so much more to say, um, but thank you so much, all of you. And in particular, thank you, uh, Professor Fassin, for your time for this wonderful book, which is so thought provoking and has generated such a wonderful event tonight. Thank you all in the audience. Very, very good night. And we hope to see you at an LSE event again very soon. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you.